You know, one of the things that, you know, you love about this country, and, and you've got to test on those things these days, uh, is the immigrants, the, the, boiling, the boiling pot. You know, my family came from, believe it or not, Ukraine. Uh, and everybody I know came from somewhere. It's very rare that you find anybody who doesn't come from somewhere else. And that's what this show is about. So we have uh, Chang Wang, and he's going to introduce our primary guest today, Judge uh, Tony Leung. And we're going to talk about the immigrant experience that Judge Leung has had. Chang, welcome to the show. Uh, Judge, welcome to the show. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Aloha, Jay. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Very, very pleased to have you be on a nation of immigrants. Let me just uh, say that Judge Leon is my role model and my hero. Everybody in Minnesota know Judge Leon, not only in the Asian Pacific Chinese American community, but to everybody in the legal community and everybody in the government. Judge Leon has been a legendary judge in the state of Minnesota. He is the first Asian Pacific American judge and the first Chinese American judge in the state of Minnesota. Judge Leong is currently a federal magistrate judge in the District United States District Court for the District of Minnesota. Before his appointment for the federal bench, Judge Leong served for nearly 17 years as a state district attorney district court judge in Minnesota's fourth judicial district in Honeyman County. Now a very famous household name, Hennepin County, uh, where the trial of Derek Chauvin happened. The, uh, the, he was first appointed to the state bench by Governor Arnie Carson in 1994. Before his elevation to the judiciary, Judge Leon was an equity partner of a big law firm now named Figure Baker Daniels. Judge Leon received his bachelor degree with honors from Yale University and his jury doctor from New York University School of Law. Welcome, Judge Leon. Thank you, Chang. And thank you, Jay, for inviting me to this program. Well, thank you for coming down, Judge. Um, I think it's uh, really a great story. And I, I do have some questions about uh, Chang's introduction. Um, number one is, you know, we have district courts here in Honolulu and Hawaii, but they are below general jurisdiction courts. Uh, and I wonder, when you talk about a district court, a state district court um, in the district, in, in the state system, um, uh, in Minneapolis there, is that general jurisdiction or something else? Yes, in Minnesota, the uh, state court system is divided into basically uh, Supreme Court, the Intermediate Court of Appeals called the Court of Appeals, and also then the district courts. The district courts are the uh, general jurisdiction trial courts for in the state of Minnesota under the state system. For example, um, uh, of course, the uh, case that um, uh, Chang referenced, um, uh, that would be conducted by a, a district judge, a state district judge. And in that case, it was uh, state district judge Regina Chu, who I know very well and who was a wonderful jurist. Now, getting into uh, United States uh, uh, Magistrate and United States District Court, that is really something. Uh, and that's a federal question, if you will, <laughs> a, na a national question. That's a whole different experience to get into a job like that. Uh, can you compare the two experiences for us? Yes, I, I would say that um, both roles, of course, are um, you're acting in a judicial function. Um, but they're quite different. Um, um, I would describe the um, state system as this is where the <laughs> power hits the road, road, the rubber meets the road in the old uh, phrase. And by that, I mean, uh, for example, in criminal matters, if something happens, if there's a, a something terrible that happens at night and there's a crime in state court, if you're on duty for um, as a duty judge, you, you'll get calls all, all hours of the night. And it could be something, um, um, you know, very dramatic. Um, and so I've had um, uh, law enforcement as a state judge uh, come over uh, and say, can you sign a warrant on uh, after hours? And only to um, learn that they believe there may be 
body part in a trunk, for example. Uh, so they're, they can be that dramatic and it's very immediate, uh, the needs. Um, in the federal court, in contrast, um, you know, especially let's say take the um, uh, criminal side, um, when you're on criminal duty in the federal courts, you don't get nearly as many of the out of the regular hours types of calls because the nature of the federal investigations are, um, um, it isn't based on, oh, someone was shot this evening and is bleeding on the street. We need to um, get some evidence immediately before it, um, you know, the uh, evanescent nature of the evidence goes away. Um, so it's, it's quite different, uh, the, the systems and the types of things that you do. Yeah, and and um, my, my sense of it just from the outside is that in the federal judiciary, it's a, sort of a national community. In other words, uh, you're pretty close with the other judges, with the federal clerks, with judges and clerks in other districts. Uh, it's, um, very, it's, it's a camaraderie that you don't find necessarily, and a broader camaraderie that you don't find necessarily in the state courts. You get to know other judges in other districts, uh, am I right? And you, and you compare notes with them and so forth. Oh, absolutely. Um, and one of the great pleasures actually of being a federal judge is that um, you, you do need to meet together in conferences to keep up on the law and developments um, in uh, different aspects related to our duties. And in that context, we meet judges from all over the country. And um, in the federal context, um, we also uh, do outreach and um, do rule of law type of uh, work with other nations as well. And in other areas, for example, I've been to Bangkok um, with the United States uh, Patent and Trade Office um, on conferences with ASEAN um, judges and um, ASEAN um, officials who are involved in um, patent and trade, for example. So there, it's quite exciting in terms of the uh, scope of um, what you get into. Um, and I think you're right, Jay, that um, there's a unique sense of a family, and we of, often call it the federal family. And um, yeah, in some ways, you know, people joke around about that uh, from time to time, but there really is. Um, and uh, it is a very supportive family so that if something happens in one area, it really happens to everybody, all the other areas, and people are aware of that and support each other. Yeah, I've noticed that. It's, a, it's admirable, actually. So, but there is a difference between being a magistrate and being a district court judge. And uh, in Hawaii, you know, every magistrate would like to be a district court judge, but not all of them get there. And uh, there's a, uh, I want to call it a, a political threshold that you have to cross before you can get there. I don't believe a magistrate has to be confirmed by Congress, but a district court judge needs to be confirmed by Congress. And, and that changes the recipe, doesn't it? Yes. Um I, I don't uh, think there's much. Uh, I did not have to uh, get vetted uh, by uh, uh, politicians on one side of the aisle or the other. Um, I was vetted by all of the uh, district judges uh, in our district, um, the uh, current actives as well as the seniors. Um, and um, I think it's I think it's very much a, a meritocracy in our selection. <laughs> Wonderful. It's good to hear. We need meritocracy and we certainly need the rule of law. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, let's talk about how you got there because it's an interesting passage. Uh, so you came from Hong Kong. You, you still speak any, uh, any Cantonese at all? Oh, I, I, I do. I can get by with Cantonese, but my, they, um, so I, my first tongue was um, Cantonese uh -huh. and um, in Hong, because I grew up in Hong Kong. Uh, then when we emigrated to the U.S., uh, my cousins, um, uh, who had been over the U.S. and they sponsored us over, um, my aunt uh, spoke and, and um, our, uh, my uncle spoke a, a dialect of uh, Cantonese called Aishan, which is actually um, a very, uh, a, a, in the past, of course, it was actually the um, probably dominant dialect in the U.S. as far as uh, Chinese immigrants. Uh, because the earliest, uh, many of the earliest immigrants were from that area of China. Uh, Taishan was a, is a very uh, poor area in terms of uh, agriculture. I remember the uh, soil as 
when I visited for the first time, it was noticeable how red it was. And it just seemed like, hmm, I don't know if this is the best growing type of soil. All right. <laughs> and it, because it was traditionally, it was very poor that they sent um, uh, uh, people overseas to earn money, whether it be in the South, South China Seas area, in Southeast Asia, or even to the Philippines, or Hawaii and the U.S. and other places. And so many people in the U.S. actually, um, the original Chinese immigrants, many of them would have been from that area of China. Yeah, so uh, your family uh, came over here. You were, what, six years old. Um, they, they come over to, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, to take possession of their multi-million dollar properties all over town. Uh, or was or was it the, the the more the more customary immigrant story? Well, the implications of that in terms of Hong Kong and China are very different uh, in, in this sense. Um, Hong Kong, uh, uh, I think at that point, I, I think was uh, really uh, thriving, and China at the time uh, when we immigrated, um, China was in the uh, beginnings of the uh, Cultural Revolution. We emigrated here in 1966. Um, you know, at that time in China, one of my, my uh, concerns of my parents was there's such chaos in China with the Cultural Revolution that um, they also knew that the uh, treaty, the lease on Hong Kong is gonna end in 97. And they knew that the Brits weren't exactly gonna go and um, defend the people of Hong Kong nor should they, frankly, yeah. uh, from uh, uh, going back because, you know, it was a lease. I mean, obviously, Hong Kong's part of China. Yeah. And so um, they, um, you know, they thought the future was probably better uh, for us here in the U.S. And uh, uh, so they left. But yeah, China at that time, believe me, um, not many uh, Chinese folks were at uh, property in the U.S. and elsewhere in the world. And people in Hong Kong, uh, Oh, from uh, our class of my uh, our, you know, my parents' class, and you know, we we didn't have property. Uh, believe me, we were. Happy I'm, I'm only that. joking, Judge. I yeah. no, I, 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 I know. I know. Yeah. We were happy but to have a flat to live in, frankly. <laughs> judge, Judge, I just uh, realized that uh, I have known you for 15 years, and uh, we we never speak uh, Mandarin Chinese. So uh, next time we meet, I probably will speak uh, Mandarin Chinese with you. <laughs> and yeah. and you, you, I'm from Beijing. So you did come to Beijing in 1980s as an uh, international exchange student. And then re you receive a diploma from Peking University. That's my alma mater. But could you share with us about your life, your time in Beijing? Do you remember what uh, Beijing's 1980s looked like to you? I was in junior high and high school in 1980s. Yeah, I, I was in um, uh, Beida in uh, 1981 um, uh, that summer. And um, it, it really was one of those eye-opening um, and in some ways transformative events in my life. Transformative in an odd way, uh, <laughs> in a sense that um, when, when I was uh, an undergraduate, um, I. Um, really focused on um, Chinese American relations and just had a deep interest in, in that area. In fact, I remember reading some articles, I think uh, Jerry Cohen, uh, Jerome Cohen wrote at that time. I had um, probably, I think that um, after John King Fairbank um, at Harvard, I think after, you know, uh, uh, you know, he started slowing down. Um, I, uh, Jonathan Spence uh, was probably, in my view, one of the preeminent um, uh, scholars of Chinese history in the West. And I had the privilege of uh, having his classes. And um, so I was very interested in, um, in China. And I can say that Professor Spence, who recently passed away, yeah. he was the best, that was the best, his introduction to modern Chinese history is the best, um, academic course I've ever taken anywhere. And um, so at that time, uh, I was extremely interested in Chinese American relations, and planned on uh, probably doing foreign service or some such thing. Um, when I got to China, um, it was eye opening. Um, I did not expect the level of um, poverty at that time still. 
I didn't um, really understand the level of development that was going to be needed to bring China into, um, you know, where I don't think anyone dreamed of where China would be today in 1981. In 1981, if you'll recall, um, there was a real question as to what the future of China is going to be. Um, the um, uh, Gang of Four had just, um, you know, uh, fallen. At the time, it was very unclear the roles of um, uh, people like um, um, uh, Deng Xiaoping um, and Hu Yaobang and uh, Zhao Ziliang. And actually, at that time, Zhao Ziliang wasn't even on the, you know, in, in terms of the, um, uh, top leadership, but um, Yao Bang was the, um, no, no, it was, uh, no, who was the, Hua Guofeng was the uh, person who was um, in uh, competition, I think, in leadership at that point. It was very unclear where that was going to go, and um, it wasn't until years later then that, uh, you know, uh, 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 Deng Xiaoping, uh, um, succeeded in, um, you know, beginning the uh, four modernizations and changing China. And of course, that was dramatic in that it was the beginning of putting uh, China on the pace of development where it is now. Um, but at the time in Beijing, I remember I was um, just very concerned about the nature of the planned economy there. Um, I don't know, Jay, you probably remember better than I do. But I remember in um, Beijing, I, I, we'd go outside. Um, I, I don't know if you remember where the old uh, 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 foreigners, uh, foreign students' dorm was. It was oh, right yeah, I do. I do. By that side yeah. door. We were right next to the, one of the yep. side doors. So we would just go out that side door. And, you know, one week, there would be a whole mound of chits on the street, uh, eggplants. And it'd be a mountain <laughs> of eggplants just thrown in the middle of an intersection, and people just grab them. The next week, it would be some other, um, you know, uh, produce. Cabbage. cabbage, yeah, cabbage. Radish. Yep. And um, let's see, at that point, we had renminbi that, you know, um, only the um, Chinese people could uh, use. And then yep. we foreigners had huihui drin, yep. which was foreign, a foreign, foreign currency foreign that currency. we could yep. use. And if you use huihui drin, we could go to the Beijing Fondin, the Peking Hotel, we could then buy a bicycle so that we can ride our bike from, you know, uh, where Beida, uh, Be, uh, Beida is into the city and into that. That, different... that, that, that was considered a car in early 1990s, yeah. 1980s. That was like Lexus. Yeah. And Jay, you couldn't even buy a bicycle without either a ticket or you had the Huawei Trend that you could uh, buy at the um, certain shops. So. At that time, I decided this was going to be too much for me, and um, I um, then was reminded I needed to do something for a living because we didn't come from a lot of money, and therefore, I went to law school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and why law school? I mean, why not medical school? Why not some? Why not architecture? Why law school? I was I, if for, for high school, I was pretty good in math, you know, as well as like I guess other uh, subjects. But I tell you. In college, when people are good at math at Yale, they were pretty good at math. I wasn't good at math. <laughs> I can I can write, I can scramble and can write. I can crank out a really good essay very quickly, but you know you can't make up certain answers to math equations. No, <laughs> that's right. Well, you had to do pretty well. I mean, were you trying hard to get into Yale? I, I can tell you, I really didn't uh, think of um, going to Yale. And um, back then, we didn't have concept of a tiger mom or, you know, developing, you know, this profile so that you could be a really good ac um, applicant, you know, get your grades, you know, get your A's and, you know, get really high test scores, extracurricular activities, show your leadership abilities. We didn't have that roadmap, um, but I was just fortunate that this, from those things I was doing, it just sort of set me up that way. No, I never intended to go to Yale. I never even thought of going to Ivy League school. My God, that was for the rich, excuse the term, that was for the rich white folks. 
Um, <laughs> and it was only after my brother, who was two years older than me, uh, I remember we lived, um, you know, three boys in one room. And I remember he must have done very well in his standardized tests or something like that, because he got an application actually from Yale. You know, Yale mailed it to him. He didn't have to you know, ask for it. He ended up just applying to Notre Dame and he got in and he went there and never applied to Yale. And, but I remember seeing, oh my God, I can't believe Yale, this, that's an Ivy League institution, is sending an application to my brother. I'm thinking, well, hey, if he, yeah, they're interested in him, maybe they're interested in me. So I applied. And, uh, yeah, it was great. How did you like Yale? Oh, it was fantastic. Um, as I said, um, I, I would say, you know, um, in many ways, uh, my experience at um, Beida that one, just that one summer was uh, very transformative. But I can say that Yale transformed me as a person. I think uh, it really, is, and it's not just academics. It's there's just a lot you you transform as a whole human being. And I think one of the magic things about Yale is that it focuses on the undergraduate uh, um, experience, and um, you know you have a lot of. Um, amazing institutions um, you know, in this country all over the world. But the thing I loved about Yale was you actually had access to the big name professors and you could you know, meet with them and talk to them. You know, again, I mentioned uh, Professor Spence uh, earlier, um, just fantastic experience. My college roommate uh, was an economics uh, major. His uh, senior advisor, I think he met him like every week probably the senior year, or, you know, at least one semester every week, uh, James Tobin, who won the Nobel um, Prize in economics. Um, and so that made it a very unique experience and classmates. I mean, you know, you just sort of have amazingly uh, talented classmates that, you know, you're, you're friends with them, you know them, not because you think they're going to do amazing things, but you just, you know, hang out with them because they're, you know, friends. And so, yeah, it was a wonderful experience. How was it racially? Racially, um, boy, I, I don't have the numbers, but I'll, I always thought it was always about the same percentage of the different races of color, you know, in the years that I, I, I was, I don't remember what it was like. Um, so I started in 78 and graduated in 82. I don't know, maybe five to... 10% Asians, I, I, I really think a while, yes, but not nearly the numbers uh, that, you know, uh, of Asians on campus now, of course, there's yeah. quite a few. Um, the one thing uh, about Yale, Judge, is that uh, like, like the federal judiciary, Yale is, uh, my observation, is a family, a family that lasts uh, really all your life. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, the Yale connections uh, do uh, last a lifetime. I do want to say one thing that's uh, unique about Yale. My uh, grandmother, who is, uh, was, you know, she was born in the Qing Dynasty in uh, uh, 1898, I believe she was born. Um, but she was one of the rare um, women who actually knew how to uh, read and write. And her Chinese, classical Chinese, was amazing, as was my mother's, uh, because their, their uh, grandparents, uh, you know, had a, actually started, you know, passed the lower level tests in the Qing dynasty at a school, actually a high school, you know, in um, uh, Taishan, in, uh, in Taishan City. And um, I remember when I mentioned that I was uh, uh, going to Yale, she uh, said it in Chinese because she knew, she, she had heard of Yale and uh, knew it was, oh yeah, wow, Yale, gosh, wow. <laughs> Pearl <That's> famous. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, there's well, not Judge, a lot of Judge. universities that a person born in the Qing dynasty would have been, oh, yeah, I know that <laughs> university. Judge, in 1890 was a year Beida was founded. Your really? grandma born in the same year as the Peking University Beida was founded. It's, <laughs> it's fascinating to hear about your family history and the family, some of your personal stories. I remember in one of the interviews you mentioned that your mother once worked at a Hilton Hotel. And uh, 44 years later, you, you sit on as a Minnesota's first Asian American federal judge on, on the bench. And it, it's, could you just tell us a little bit about your parents? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think obviously parents uh, shaped a uh, um, major part of who I am and the values that I hold. 
Um, I would say um, my uh, father uh, really was uh, exemplar in uh, uh, as being a role model of hard work. Um, he um, his family is very poor from southern that part of southern China. My dad was sent um, off to work on a plantation in uh, the Philippines. Uh, I believe he was twelve or fourteen years old, and when he was there, he was uh, just helping with some uh, relatives who owned a plantation there apparently. And he was just there helping cook rice and cook food and stuff, uh, you know, as a 12 year old kid. And he would send money back to China. That's how poor that area of China was. And um, so when, um, after the liberation of China, uh, my father was, um, well, actually after World War II, my um, uh, father, uh, was back in China at time and then uh, ultimately uh, went to Hong Kong and um, then married my uh, mother when he was still in uh, China. Um, my father went out to Hong Kong. My mother remained in China um, during the liberation. And after the liberation, my, um, the, my mother came out to, um, went out to Hong Kong and joined my dad. My dad became a tailor. Um, so he made Western suits and I still remember to this day as we left Hong Kong on the way to Honolulu, Hawaii, where we first entered the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, back then, it was 1966. So my father, of course, you know, he was an excellent tailor. We had these, I, I see these pictures of us. That we looked like um, sort of like these little people in Beatles outfits. <laughs> those very narrow, you know, very narrow, tight-fitting jackets, narrow collars very narrow ties and so forth that remember the British invasion and their, their clothing. Um, so I, I remember that. And then, uh, but my father uh, gave up a lot when he left Hong Kong because he had a very um, uh, thriving tailoring business. When he came here, he became a cook in a kitchen. And the reason we um, uh, ended up in Minneapolis is back then there was a big Chinese restaurant called the Nankin. A lot of our local people Older uh, local people would know that restaurant. It was one of the few Chinese restaurants here that was big enough that you could bring in, you know, extra cooks in the kitchen and so forth. That's how we ended up in Minneapolis, purely just to get a job. But I tell you, my dad worked very hard. My mother um, uh, was um, a stay-at-home mom, uh, extremely bright. You know, uh, grandmother extremely bright. Um, my father was extremely bright. And, um, but I remember my mo mother, when she came to the U.S., uh, you know, she had to work outside the home to make ends meet. Um, you know, she started uh, sort of the typical, almost like a stereotype. She worked for a short time in a laundry mat or a laundry uh, business. And then after that, she ended up uh, being a cook. And she was a cook in the, uh, back then it was a Hilton Hotel on, uh, you know, on Kellogg and, um, you know, right on the right by the bridge, a um, Kellogg and Cedar in that area, um, and the um, kitchen she worked in um, was called Don the Beachcomber, sort of a Polynesian theme in uh, in um, the Hilton. And we lived in South Minneapolis near Lake Elendale. She took a bus, you know, hours, probably an hour and a half, getting there, an hour and a half coming back just to do that cooking job. And I remember there was one incident, it was frighteningly cold. We're in the middle of February, uh, well, January now, in the coldest times in Minnesota. You know, there was one um, occasion where she and her friend were waiting for a bus. You know, there was one stop that they had, one transfer they needed. And there weren't the heated shelters or anything like that. Um, the bus that was supposed to pick them up passed them by. And so there wouldn't be another bus for half an hour. And they were freezing cold and um, I mean they were lucky they made it back and you know that's what I remember as uh, what they did and when they eventually saved enough money to open a restaurant their first five years they worked um, I think they were only off a full day on Christmas day and Thanksgiving two days off for five years a year well that's a you know it's a story of an immigrant family a working immigrant family making the best of it and giving you the opportunity. And I, and I wonder, you know, what, uh, what effect, what benefit, what, what influence does the, you know, your Chinese background 
your immigration experience, your family, and so forth. What, what effect does that have on you in terms of your entry into the legal marketplace, um, your work for uh, a private law firm, your service on the, on the Minnesota bench, your service on the federal bench? How does that affect the way you see things, the way you do your legal practice, your participation in the legal community, you know, the Federal Bar Association and the like? Um, and how does it affect your way of looking at things in court? I think the first thing it does is it makes me uh, very optimistic about uh, the prospects of America. And we hear the phrase, the promise of America um, used uh, a lot, but you know, sometimes you wonder how you know, much people really mean and what they mean by it. But that immigrant experience really um, is a validation that that is not just a uh, hackneyed phrase that's overused. It is a true, it's a reality that is available in America, is that the concept of hard work and opportunity as long as those opportunities are fair and there are no barriers that are laid in people's way, that's the promise of America that you can go for it and not everyone can make it, but you will have a fair shot at it. And that's why I always think you got to think back. Don't, don't kid ourselves that, oh, the promise of America means everything's a smooth road and everything's hunky-dory, uh, fair and equal. The reality is there is a lot of inequality as well. And um, you think of um, you know, the importance of things like education and the right to you know, travel. Think about it. When we came here, we first arrived in, uh, outside of in Aurora, Illinois, a, a town outside of Chicago, about 45, 40 miles west of it. Because we had the right to travel, my dad could get, get to Minneapolis and work there. Because you had the right to get what job you wanted and there was no bar to that, he was able to get that job. Doesn't sound like a glorious job, but hey, we, he made it because of that ability to get that. We, when we got to Minneapolis, we, we didn't have money for private schools. We didn't have tutors, believe me. We didn't have tutors you know, getting us all ready to uh, apply for the highly competitive schools. You know? um, but you know, that free education in Minneapolis, you know, Put me in one of the top institutions in uh, the world, put my brother in another in one of the top institutions. My other siblings all graduated from um, college and you know, have profession had professional careers. So um, all of those things are very important. We could buy a house where we wanted to. So think about it, equality of education, travel, work, housing, those are the fundamental build blocks of life. And um, those are available in America, but at the same time, there are barriers. One of my first experiences I remember, um, I didn't speak English when I was in Aurora first year, um, and I was on, you know, they put you in speech class back then, but in reality, we were, you know, we were learning English. Um, you know, as a kid at six years old, you learn to pick up languages very easily, in all candor. Um, and I did, but at that time in Aurora, I was still learning. And I remember my uncle used to pick us up out of, after elementary school. I was in first grade. And I remember this friend of mine walked me out uh, to the door and then my uncle sitting in the station wagon waiting for me. And then, you know, I hop in, yeah, you know, hop in, he takes off, he closes the door. And after we were on the road, after we left the school, he says, oh, don't talk to that uh, uh, boy anymore. And I said, oh, why? That's my friend. And um, he was a white kid who, you know, when he walked me out, you know, I thought he was my friend. You know, I didn't know what his, he seemed nice. But um, uh, my uncle said, when they bow to you and go ching chong, ching chong, they are making fun of you. They're not your friend. And that's a reality of America, too, that we face those types of issues. Yeah. Last question, Judge, at least from me, um, is this. Um, you know, you, you date back a few years. You entered school and the law and practice and the bench a long time already. Um, and I wonder what, what, whether that's the same as an immigrant would experience today. 
uh, or have things changed? And what would your advice be to somebody who, you know, is um, you know following your track and um, uh, also we'll say a Chinese immigrant right now today? How would it differ? What would you advise? And you know, what are the prospects? I I still believe that the promise of America is there. I also believe that the opportunities are there. At the same time, I believe that we are in a situation in this country where we need to protect um, the middle class and the middle class is feeling very challenged. And as a result of that, new immigrants, if people are entering the middle class or wherever they land, or striving to be the middle class. Sort of, that's where we were, you know, when we came over here. Um, but if, in fact, uh, there is challenges to maintaining that middle class, I think naturally there's going to be um, um, more competition in that sense. And when you have competition, people feel, feel threatened. So one of the key things I think we have to do is keep on emphasizing the concept that. You know, it's almost like the trade concept that if you have people who are really good at doing one thing and another group is really going, you want to maximize each of their abilities because ultimately it's uh, better for everybody. And I think that uh, the important thing is to just make sure everyone uh, realizes that, you know, the, the folks that have been here a long time add a lot of um, to the system. But the new folks that are arriving, will add a lot to the new system. So the idea is that we should um, assimilate in terms of the principles of democracy and the fundamentals of government. By that, I mean, when people come to the US, I think people have to assimilate in a, and melt into and believe the concept of the constitution, the three parts of government, um, the rule of law, that is where people have to buy in. I think that's very important. But where it really helps to have a blending as opposed to an acquisition over people, where you have a blending of different cultures and taking the different aspects of each culture, the best parts of those cultures, putting it together. That's where you get the synergy that results in one plus one is more than two. Yes, sir. Absolutely. We're out of time, uh, Chang. Can you uh, can you summarize uh, the essence of what we should take away from this conversation? And can you thank the judge? I will thank the judge first. Uh, we are very lucky to have you, judge. We're very lucky to have you in Minnesota. You know, I'm from Beijing, the northern part of China, and I always admire people from the tropical region settled and up in Minnesota. And please stay here. Uh, I, I just want to say that, you know, uh, Judge, you have appreciated your share, your personal story, and many good advice to our audience and young, uh, young people. That you do mention the promise of America, and you, in one of the previous lectures, you mentioned the limit of promise America. And I truly appreciate your optimism, you know, overall optimism about the future of America. Because I, I like one of the quotes, I really strike me and uh, remind me many of your teachings and your comments is nothing wrong about America cannot be corrected by what's wrong, what's right about America. So again, thank you so much, Judge, and thank you, Jay Aloha, to host this show. Thank you, Judge Leung. Thank you, Chang Wang. Um, a nation of immigrants, thank you so much. Aloha. <laughs>